So the goal of the talk is going to be to evaluate the risk factors of recurrent urinary tract infections after sling surgery, discuss when and how to evaluate patients that present to you with these recurrent infections, and evaluate if there are any indications for sling removal and how we can get uh, at that conclusion if that is necessary. Uh, some of this is based on a recent review that we published in the current bladder dysfunction reports um, that would have kind of the complete uh, lit literature review on, in this subject. Mid-urethral slings, um, as you know, are very common. Uh, women are affected with stress urinary incontinence. The rates reported in the literature is anywhere between 35 and 50 percent of women will experience this symptom. And about 10 percent of women in the United States will undergo surgery uh, for stress incontinence. The rates for revision for complications for mid urethral slings is very low, and we're going to go through a little bit of that data. But the most common indications for revision include urinary retention, voiding dysfunction, max extrusion, pain, and recurrent UTIs. Um, this is a study from Canada. It's actually from their a database in Ontario. Um, they are able to track all the slings that were placed in patients for stress urinary incontinence between the year 2002 and 2010. So the, uh, 12. So this is a 10-year cohort, and they had about a 60,000 women that underwent a sling. And as you can see, the number of women who needed retreatment for a complication was low. It was 2.2 percent. The 10-year cumulative incidence rate was 3.29, and the complications were similar in gynecologists and urologists. Although the big majority of the sling procedures were placed by gynecologists, over 70 percent of them were. The mo um, one of the things that I want to point out is this is one. One of those things that people who are in this field, we kind of know, but we have never been able to show or prove. But this is one of the first studies that looked at number of slings. You know, when people come and they have a mid urethral sling, and it failed, and somebody put a TLT, and it failed, and then somebody puts a TBT, and after that, the amount of mesh, you know, the burden of mesh it, underneath the urethra really increases the chances of risk. So it's something that you have to really keep in mind when patients have previous sling surgeries, not to keep putting uh, some of these materials one on top of the other. So you can see that patients with multiple sling, their absolute risk increase uh, of complications with a hazard ratio of about 4.73. And as in many other surgeries, patients of low volume surgeons were much more likely to have a complication that needed removal or revision, about 37% in low volume surgeons compared to high volume surgeons. The most common complications are bleeding, max exposure is probably one of the most common. Um, the novel urgency, urge incontinence, obstruction that we can have with any anti-incontinence procedure, pain, dyspareunia, um, erosion is very unusual in a visceral injury, recurrent or uh, persistent stress incontinence, and recurrent urinary tract infections. And that's what we're going to focus in terms of complication for the rest of the talk. Now, there are clear reasons why somebody might have recurrent urinary tract infections. This is not the aim of this talk. You know, things that happen where people have mesh in the bladder, stones in the bladder, or exposures such as these. Of course, you will think these materials are going to be colonized. The, the interest really for this talk is how about the patient who is otherwise perfectly well from their sling? So uh, the patient that has good continence results, that is not obstructed, that is not in retention, yet comes to you with recurrent urinary tract infections. So when we look at what we have available in terms of acute urinary tract infections, the, uh, the most common risk factor for patients having a, a UTI perioperatively is the inability to empty or the need to catheterize, and that makes sense. In a multicenter case study control found that the rate of acute UTI in women who fell initial voiding trial is about 20% compared to about 6% of those who voided immediately. Looking at risk factors for acute urinary tract infection, there is another study uh, that look at National Surgical Quality Improvement Program database between 2006 and 2014, and they had about 9,000 patients that had undergone gone a mid urethral sling. They excluded kind of older patients, sick patients, ASA more than four, patients that had other surgeries, a prolapse, so they're really looking just as the sling. And to try to get as a surrogate for an uncomplicated sling, they look at surgeries that lasted uh, less than an hour. So if anything lasted longer than that, they assume something was not right in the surgery, so they excluded those patients. And the rate within the first 30 days of patients having a urinary tract infection is about 2.6%. And the main risks that they found in this cohort was older patients, older than 65, a BMI uh, larger than 40, so obesity. Um, 
And it was more common in gynecologists when they look at specialties than patients treated by urologists. Really no clear explanation. This is a database study. Um, there was a group that attempted to do a kind of randomized study. Do patients need perioperative antibiotics? I mean, the rate is pretty slow, low. So the rate was so low, they actually couldn't randomize people. They had to stop the study. So this study hasn't been done. We kind of, uh, I think, it's standard of care to routinely give at least one dose of IV antibiotics within an hour of the procedure. Um, but when we're looking, so the, the, the rest of this talk is going to really talk about the patient that comes in has had three, four, five urinary tract infections, and they had, you have worked everything else up, and they had a sling four years ago, or two years ago, or three years ago. So the definition of recurrent urinary tract infection is three or more UTIs in 12-month period. The data is very scarce in this subject, and there's significant limitations. Um, not everybody follows the definition, so a lot of Studies talk about recurring urinary tract infections. We don't know what that means. Um, a lot of them are self-report. There are very few studies that have done culture-proven infections so that you know what organisms are growing and if, are they true infections. Many of them are retrospective review with a significant recall bias when you ask the patients, did you have this problem before surgery or is this is kind of a new problem? So the, with this caveat of this uh, um, uh, limitations of what we have, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the data that we do have available. So in a retrospective review um, study published in 2014, the recurrent urinary tract infection, the rate was 2.3%. Uh, a different study that wasn't looking exactly at recurrent infection, they were actually looking at patients who needed revision of sling, and they did a case control study of about 3,000 patients. The sling revision rate in that uh, study was about 2.7%. And when you look in detail of that 2.7% that needed a revision, about 20% of them was because of recurring urinary tract infections. And these were culture proven in 12 months. It's one of the few studies that actually did uh, culture proven um, studies. In a different cohort, and this is actually based on an HMO uh, that had kind of good data about the number of urethral slings done in the whole HMO system. Um, and they had about 7,000 patients in a three-year period, and the rate of recurring urinary tract infection in that cohort was about 3.5%. And the main risks of having recurring infection afterwards was having infections before. So patients do have recurring infections. So patients who had infections before surgery were more likely by a lot to have recurring infections afterwards. Again, they found the same uh, likelihood of older women having this. Uh, unclear to me, and the only studies have shown a racial difference in recurring infections with um, uh, whites and African Americans being more likely to have recurring urinary tract infections. But interestingly, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, about 50% of patients that had infections before continued having uh, infections afterwards. Now, of the biggest databases that we have are clearly the NIH-sponsored studies that have been um, uh, multi-institutional uh, randomized studies that were not Again, no study have been designed to look at infections as an outcome. So these are secondary analysis. So in a multivariate regression analysis of the sister and Thomas trials, the sister study looked at pool of vaginal slings versus um, BIRDS. The Thomas trial looked at TOT versus TBT. There were approximately uh, 1,252 patients. And the main risk that they found for uh, UTI at six weeks was having a pre-op UTI, again, having to catheterize or having bladder perforation at the time of placement. As you know, when you do a TBT, it's not uncommon for people to have a perforation and reposition the needle. So we're not talking about mesh in the bladder, but actually just having the perforation. But recurring urinary tract infection was very consistent with every other study that have done retrospective observational studies about two to three percent. So in this population, it was two percent. Now, um, Women with recurrent urinary tract infections, this is without a sling, are five times more likely to suffer from urinary incontinence. And uh, women with a history of recurrent UTIs also tend to have more severe incontinence. So in our field, one of uh, sometimes indications for treatment of incontinence is the lady that comes in with recurrent UTIs and is wet. And you think, well, maybe if I make them dry, they, you, you take off one of the risks of recurrent UTIs in this population. Um, what we have learned from these studies is that less than 50% of patients, uh, even after, no, despite of what treatment you give them, even after you make them continent, you will actually cure the recurrent infection. So this is a multi, 
factorial issue of why patients have infections. So the indication of doing a sling or a procedure just for a recurrent urinary tract infection, you have to be very careful um, as an indication. Now, we don't have any guidelines of what to do with patients with recurrent infections. These are guidelines from Canada. The only, I'm not gonna go through the guidelines because the purpose of the talk is really to look at recurrent infections in sling and not so much as what do we do with women with recurrent infections. But what I wanted to point out is that the indication for a cystoscopy is only when there are risk factors for complicated UTI. Now, my, I'm gonna argue that anybody who's had a sling is in that category. So any patient that comes after surgery has recurrent infections needs a cystoscopy because of those ugly pictures I showed you before where they can be things that happen at the time of surgery. You can have mesh stones, sutures, and other things inside the bladder and the urethra. And um, the AUA is actually in the process of coming up with guidelines for the treatment of recurrent infection, but I think the, norm, the, the, the normal pathway, if you have a patient that is otherwise perfect from the outcome of surgery, is to try to prevent these infections, put them in prophylactic protocols, maybe give them estrogen, vitamin C, things that we know can decrease the risk of infection. But what if that fails? So the patient comes to you, they have kind of de novo recurrent infections, so they were fine for a long time and now they're three, four, five years after their surgery and they're having infection after infection. You try to prevent them, you're failing. You know, they're getting an infection every two months. So um, I became very interested in that population of patients um, a few years ago. Um, and we were interested in what, we can, what can we do to assess um, these slings? Now, uh, there's indications of imaging, re clearly recurrent UTI in that group of patients that I just described was interesting to me as to what is happening or is, can these links be related at all or are they totally unrelated to these recurrent infections. The other group are patients that come in with pain, especially if they didn't have it immediately after surgery, so they, that you think is actually a surgical thing, they are fine for two or three years and all of a sudden they have chronic pain. Patients who, Doc, I had a surgery 15 years ago, they took out my uterus, and I think they did something for my incontinence too, and you cannot feel that sling, you're not sure if they had a mesh sling, or they have no mesh, or what's happening with them. So patients have uh, unclear history, and you don't have operative reports. And also the patient that comes in and say, oh, but my mesh was removed. It can definitely not be my mesh, this is not a problem. Removal, when people have mesh removals, can be a millimeter, a centimeter, 10 centimeters, a whole TBT measures approximately 15 centimeters if you take the arms. So what do people mean by removal is actually also very complicated, even if you have an up, up report, you not always can tell. So um, there are not a lot of options. MRI and CT do not show these links, um, but ultrasound does. So we develop a protocol with a radiologist. At this time I was at UCLA, so we developed it there. Um, using a covilinear probe uh, to the labia and perineum. So this is not transvaginal, we're doing translabial uh, ultrasounds. And we use two probes, a five megahertz to use to look at the anatomy and a nine megahertz to look at uh, the mesh itself. We uh, did two, 2D static images and then 3D reconstructions and also CNE. You can have the patient strain, Valsalva, and kind of do kind of the CNE reconstructions. And I just wanna show you some of these pictures in a sagittal view this high intensity thing is a sling, and you can see the urethra and the symphysis pubis and the rectum behind it. The views I, um, sorry, the views I like are these. You know, you can see clearly the mesh, and what you can see is the urethra and the lumen, but you can see the urethra wall. And when you do a 3D reconstructions, you really can get really nice imaging of these slings. Um, and we were looking to see, can we predict if this was a TOT or a uh, transobturator versus a retropubic sling, and what else can we determine from this um, images? Now this is a nicely positioned sling. You see the, the wall of the urethra is intact, and the, and, and the sling is on the other side of the wall of the urethra. This is a patient that presented with recurring UTIs after a TOT, and that sling is in the wall of the urethra. Now you can see to that patient, you don't see mesh, because it's not through the urethra but you do an ultrasound and that sling is in the wall of the urethra. So um, we looked at some of these patients and um, we had um, about 30 patients that we evaluated with uh, as a first cohort. And um, of these patients, we could tell in, in all of them if it was a retropubic uh, TOT and where in the urethra it was, if it was distal, mid, or proximal. So all these patients were gonna have removal. So we were able to take their specimen out and confirm it in surgery. But for 
what's important for this talk is that of patients that we found uh, the mesh in the wall of the urethra at the time of surgery, only one of them we had seen it on cystoscopy. The other six had it in the wall of the urethra when we went to remove the mesh, but we could not see it in the lumen. So you, ultrasound, is, it is useful in this patient population. Now this was all prompted, I think this was in 2009. I had this patient, we still communicate, she emails me all the time. She was at the time 52 years old and she had had a TBT five years prior. And uh, she had a one and a half year history, so she was fine for a number of years, and, uh, and then had a one and a half year history of recurring UTIs that were happening monthly. And this resistant profile was changing to a point that she was resistant to every antibiotic. She walked around with a pick line. And her infectious disease doctor, she was a Kaiser patient, her infectious disease doctors told her, well, you might die with your right next UTI, which is really, really nice thing to say to a patient. She freaked out. So she wanted the sling out. She was convinced it must be my sling. This doesn't make any sense. It has to be the sling. Of course, she was continent. She had a cysto. She had urodynamic. She was not obstructed. She was not in retention. She had no extrusion. And this was 2009, so this was so kind of early in the mesh um, debacle. So. Nobody wanted to remove this thing, you know? So she sued Kaiser, and she said, I, 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 and she actually had a lawsuit, and if I give you her name, you'll find her all over the internet. And she came to me with, you know, I want this lawsuit, you can take my sling out. I had never taken a sling for no other indication than recurrent infection. It was like, she was perfect, you know? Um, and she convinced me, and we took the sling out, and she never had an infection ever again. Okay, anecdotal, we all have patients like that. But I started thinking, why? I mean, how could this be? So we uh, did a study, and again, there's some significant limitations on this type of studies that we published in 2016, where we were looking at can these meshes be infected? You know, these otherwise normal meshes, can they be colonized even if they're not extruded? So we uh, evaluated 107 patients that were undergoing mesh removal for a number of indications, and we sent these meshes for aerobic and anaerobic culture. And what we found was that more than 50% of these meshes were, were infected, men, some of them with more than 10 different organisms. Um, and this is kind of, uh, it, that was published in this cohort, this is of these 107 patients, if you can see, 46 were this type of patient, recurrent infection, recurrent infection, recurrent infection, nobody can, can prevent, nobody can uh, uh, prevent infection, even with prophylaxis, nobody knows what to do with them, and we removed this measure. So 46 of those um, in that cohort actually were for recurrent infections. So it's something to keep in mind. I, I, there are limitations to this study. We don't have people who are fine, that have no complications, right? We cannot go take their meshes out and see if they also have infections. Um, we have followed this up, and there's a, um, um, some of the people that I worked with with this, uh, I'm not involved, but some of the people I worked with for this paper have, co have continued looking at more chronic pain than recurrent infections, and there's a paper that's gonna be presented at SUFU, it hasn't been published, where they actually look at obstruction patients as control, vaginal extrusion as control. So the vaginal extrusion you will think will be colonized. Anything in the vagina that thing has it is kind of obvious. So that was the positive control. Then they use um, patients that had obstruction but no other symptom and then they look at patients that had chronic pain developed years later after the placement and they have found definitely significant bacterial uh, colonization much different than was in the vagina and um, definitely not present in the obstruction cohort that are uh, colonized. Uh, so there's something to be said. The vaginal region is not sterile. We are using a material that we put through the vagina in women, so it is not unusual to think that there will be some colonization. The question is, is that significant? Is it meaningful? And I, I challenge you to at least think about it. I don't know the answer to that question at this point. So in summary, the rate of infection after surgery is very low. The main risk factor is having a history of UTIs is uh, postoperative retention for an acute UTI. There's currently no evidence that curing uh, stress incontinence cures preoperative recurrent UTIs. Translabial ultrasound can be useful in the evaluation of these patients, and patients with recurring UTIs and chronic pain have a high risk of bacterial colonization. It's, we talked, somebody talked about biofilm for penile things, where it, this is the, the, what we're thinking of these devices as well, that there might be a protected environment uh, around these meshes that uh, keeps the bacteria there. Now, even if it was infected, how that 
translates to a urinary tract infection and at those organisms that we are seeing in the urine the same that we're seeing in the mesh, that hasn't been done. I mean, there's a lot of things that can be done with this type of line of thinking. Thank you.